Thank you all, um, those present, those who had presented. Uh, it's been your input that not, now creates this expression. When I was 11 years old, I sold papers on a corner in Miami, Florida, on the corner of 27th Avenue and Carl Way. I used to ride my bike there after school, usually go home first, get a snack, and then sell the papers. I got out of school late one day, and I went directly to the corner, but the papers hadn't arrived yet, and I was hungry. So all of a sudden, I saw Saunders Hardware across the street. I walked into Saunders Hardware, and I stole a candy bar. I put it in my back pocket, and as I started walking out, I heard this voice in my head, nobody saw you. And then something stopped me in my tracks. And I realized something was watching me. It was the first time in my life that I knew there was a difference between the chatter in the mind and that which observed everything with no comment. Gary Greenberg said, every cell has a job. He showed you a heart cell doing this. The lung cells do this. The vascular system does this. The whole system is doing this. We think of it as the respiratory cycle, but it's really the part of our being that is being entrained by the frequency of wellness of the universe. Every cell has a job. That means that every tree has a job. Every animal has a job. Every universe has a job. The tree is never reminded or has to think about its job. It not only is guided continually throughout its lifetime, but it is always placed precisely in the environment it needs to be to nourish it. No thought required. The same is true for every species Today, you had an incredible example. 18 or 20 people came up. Some of them were born with the job to sing, others to paint, others to plant, others to speak. We think we have to prepare, but all that we really know is what we know by heart. And that's what was displayed here today. So what is this about? Just recognizing the fact that everything in this universe is being animated by the same something. There is an animating force. It doesn't make any difference what you call it or if you have no name at all. There is something that is moving everything. I remember a few years ago, my daughter, Genia, asked me to step out on the lanai and said, Dad, can I speak with you for a couple minutes? I said, sure. She said, something happened yesterday. I want to share it with you because I want to know whether I made the right choice. She began speaking with me and something grabbed my attention and my head and eyes turned to the right and there was this large tree. And I had this incredible epiphany and I turned to Gina and I said, Gina, did you see that? And she says, what do you mean, the tree? I said, yes. I said, what do you notice? She says, it's swaying back and forth. I said, if you didn't know that wind existed, you might assume the tree was moving itself. But since you know that wind exists, even though you can't see the wind, 
you know that it's actually the wind that's animating the movement of the tree. She said, yeah, that's right. I said, what do you think is animating the wind? Something even more invisible. Sometimes we walk through our life, we observe others appearing to move, and we forget about the invisible wind. Much of my last 40 years has dealt with the science of light, vision, and consciousness. I started out as a, an eye doctor and a vision scientist, but as with all of us, certain, at a certain point of our life, we realize we understand absolutely nothing. Sometimes we forget that the closer we get to the horizon, the further it moves away. We think we're getting close to the answer, but life has a very interesting way of continually cutting the distance to the goalpost in half. So we don't actually ever arise at the answer, except occasionally we have a direct experience a time when no one is looking and everything is seen. So let's talk about light. The Bible describes God as light. It says God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Quantum physicists speak about this indescribable, non-material something and in their own words, say it behaves as though it's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Light interacts with the eye, the windows of the soul, and travels deep inside of our system to the pineal gland, what Descartes termed the seed of the soul. Here, this fundamental primal energy of life travels through the windows of the soul to the seat of the soul, illuminating our lives. And we think we have to make things happen. So let's talk about this. As an eye doctor, I was trained to believe that the eye looks for things. Look at all of our discussions from the time we're children. We have to make things happen. We have to make something of ourselves. We have to make choices. We have to know the secret. We need to make it happen. We create our own reality. I'd like you to consider something. Consider the possibility that the eye looks for nothing and that life is looking for us. Consider the possibility that the eye never moves or initiates anything. The eye only responds when light calls it. It's a reflex. That's why we say, oh, it caught my eye. But no one asked the question, what was it that caught your eye? Why does the light call us from this side or this side or guide us in a certain direction? Because every cell has a job. And something is guiding that movement through life, taking us precisely where we need to be, not a second early and not a second late, because what is animating that guiding force within us is also causing the rising and setting of the sun, the changes of the weather, the movement of the tides. It's the exact same animating force. When the light grabs the attention of the eye, the eyes reflexively move. The body then reorients itself to the next piece of life, the next curriculum that is calling to us. At the moment of that contact, the drop of water hits the still lake 
and the drop disappears, and so does the lake, and all that's left is this impact. And that is called presence. There is no one being present. There is just presence. It's a moment of knowing the entanglement of everything, except there's no nowhere there. There just is an isness. Simultaneous to the eyes moving, something becomes clear. In vision science, they call it focus, so you think it's like focusing a microscope, but it has nothing to do with that. That's why we say, I see, because it becomes clear and understandable all by itself. It happens with no effort. We have two eyes. Each one gives you a slightly different perspective. They work in unison. When those two perspectives come together, we experience depth, stereopsis, three-dimensionality. But three-dimensionality is not depth. Depth is depth. You look into things. You see deeply into things. Jesus was quoted as saying, when thine eye be single, you shall enter into the kingdom. The word single comes from the Greek word haplos. Haplos means to weave. When the two become one, then you enter into this experience. The great sage Sengsten, 18 years ago, 1800 years ago, said, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, the world is clear and undisguised. Make the slightest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, hold no opinions for or against anything. To hold what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. When the deep meaning of things is not understood, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. How could I experience the magic that occurs all by itself in a moment of emptiness if I had it all prepared. Just think how much preparation we do every day of our life to make sure we show up appearing a certain way, not realizing what the effect of that is. You'll never know this miracle that it happens all by itself until, as Byron said, you go beyond the reef. When light interacts with the eye, aside from what it does to stimulate vision, most of the light goes through the eye to the portion of the brain known as the hypothalamus, the brain's brain the CEO of the system, the part of the brain that controls the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system, the initiator of the stress response, where all of our immune functions and emotions con connect and collect. The information is also experienced by the pineal, the seed of the soul, the sphincter of thought, the third eye, the regulator of regulators. When it is experienced by the pineal, every cell in the body simultaneously experiences what time of the day is it, what time of the year is it, what's the spectral composition. It experiences the intelligence, the godliness impregnated into the light 
And then every cell orchestrates its internal function so that it is continually synchronizing itself with Mother Nature. The whole purpose of light and vision is to continually bring us into a state of oneness. There is nothing to do. It is happening automatically. Our whole life is about the distillation we call transformation or evolution. We are continually being brought there. But we've been conditioned to think that this chatter is thought. And thought is what made us smarter than all the other species. But you know, when you say, I think it's going to rain, what you really say is, I don't know. So thinking means I don't know. It's different than absolute knowing, which doesn't come from us. So consider the possibility that just as we call health, you know, disease care, health care, and death insurance, life insurance, we call worrying thinking. Because the truth is, when life is flowing, there's no thought or care in the world. But when things are not going our way, then the worrying begins. Is that thought? Let me share with you my experience of creation. It's not the chatter I'm experiencing. It's the thoughts that are having me. Consider the possibility that the real thinking is that seed of goodness that's planted into our awareness that actually moves us in a certain direction. Yes, Gary Greenberg follows this movement and looks into the microscope, but what is it that moves him in the middle of the night to even look into that direction? Where is that spark of inspiration before we say, oh, I had a thought? Did we have the thought? Or did the thought have me? Since I'm a small child, I have these experiences of feeling continually guided. I'll just share with you one little experience because my time is just about done. A year ago, I had to do the presidential address at a large conference that I was president of. The year before that, shortly after I was inducted, Terry and I left Colorado, went home. I went to sleep one night. In the middle of the night, all of a sudden I notice that I'm noticing myself sleeping in the bed. I can hear a subtle breathing. And all of a sudden, I realize that I'm aware of the sleeping body's dreams. Don't ask me how this happens. I don't understand it. I begin to see myself doing the presidential address a year later. I see my daughter introducing me and a friend. I get up in the morning, I say, Terry, I had the most amazing experience. I saw the whole presidential address from beginning to end, including who was introducing me. Without going into the details, Things just worked out that way without me doing anything, and that is exactly the way it occurred. What is the level of seeing that Jonathan Swift was speaking about when he said, real vision is the ability to see the invisible? What is that level of insight that comes to us free of charge, giving a sense of what has yet to arrive? What does that tell us about what we call the future? or what we call time, or what we call space. So when something enters your awareness, it's looking for you. Whether it's the dirty dish, or your bed not made, or a bill needing to be paid, or a phone call, or an email needing to be returned, don't prioritize it. The intelligence of the universe has prioritized everything already. It takes work to choose 
consider being choiceless. Thank you. Is your mind blown yet? <laughs> <laughs>